Okay guys, let's start off by unboxing the new controllers and seeing exactly what it is that you get for your money. And we will be starting things off with the most unchanged of the bunch, which would be the Xbox Series controller. Here's a quick look at the packaging. And let's get through unboxing. Got a nice little seal there that removes easily. Here's the controller itself. For a point of reference, I do have the previous generation controller. A set of AA batteries. A code for Game Pass Ultimate. That's interesting. And some literature. These do cost anywhere from $60 to $65 depending on color options. They do go on sale every now and then. Most recently on Black Friday and Cyber Monday they were on sale for about $40. Aesthetically speaking, not much has changed with this controller comparing to the previous generation. Microsoft took more of a if it's not broke don't fix it approach. However, everything they did change is more of a breath of fresh air than anything. All the shiny surfaces such as this are all gone on the new controller as well as the triggers themselves. This feels much much better to hold in the hand. This surface was more of a dust magnet and fingerprint magnet than anything. As you can see on the triggers. Another welcome improvement is the switch to USB type C instead of the micro USB port. Let's have a moment of silence for the micro USB port. Rest in peace, you will not be missed. One of the other changes that I'm not particularly fond of is the omission of the traditional D-pad like this one. Instead they went in favor of a circular design kind of like their Pro controller but more of a cheap knockoff. I don't really know how to feel about this yet. One because I haven't really gotten much of a chance to really try it. It is nice and clicky but I'm not sure how well it's going to pair with certain genres such as fighting games which I do like to play a lot of. But I guess time will tell. Other notable mentions are these textures that they put on the back of the controller as well as on the triggers to give you a little bit more of a grip. This is nice comparing to the slippery surfaces of the previous generation controller. I'm sure they're going to work out pretty well in practice as well. Oh, and the share button. They included one of those. You know, the same one that's been on the DualShock 4 since 2013. Thanks Microsoft. You finally caught up with the times. Also, as you've seen in the unboxing, still no rechargeable battery. We're still using double A's in 2020. Maybe next time. If there is a next time. There's not much else to really say here. Most of the buttons feel the same other than the D-pad. The analog sticks are fine, just like they've always been. The bumpers are pretty decent. The triggers, I am interested to see how they're going to hold up. Right now they feel really good, more tactile than the previous ones. However, if you look at the build quality on the previous controller, I've had this one for a couple of years now. Hear that squeaking noise? Yeah, that started after like two years worth of use. And I'm not a super heavy gamer as you can tell. Also, my Xbox One controller is the original model. And as you can see, it did not have the 3.5mm jack for a headset. I know those did come in the later models for the One X and the One S. But they also do come on the new controller. Which is nice because I do use this a lot for PC gaming. Alright, let's unbox the DualSense controller for the PlayStation 5, which is probably the biggest departure from the previous generation DualShock 4. In the box you do get the controller, and that looks like it's about it. You get some literature and that's it. Pretty much like the Xbox. The controller itself costs $70. 
It has not been on sale and probably will not be anytime soon. One, because Sony is Sony and they do whatever they want and pretty much can get away with it. And two, unlike Microsoft, they did put some R&D time into this controller to actually make it a next-gen experience comparing to a copy and paste. Comparing this to the previous generation DualShock 4, the differences are actually pretty significant. Aesthetically speaking, the two are much farther apart than the Series X and the One X controller. But in Sony's case, aesthetically, things did need to improve quite a bit more than the Xbox needed. Ergonomics of the new controller are much, much better comparing to the DualShock 4. Especially for somebody like me who has bigger hands. This controller never fit that comfortably. It was always a little bit loose. Whereas the new controller, the feel of this one is much closer to the Xbox controller than it is to the previous generation PlayStation controller. However, Sony didn't just stop at improving the overall dimensions of the controller. They also did focus a lot on the functionality of the controller to improve the play experience. For example, the triggers are adaptive. Depending on if the developer chooses to take advantage of this, they can simulate certain actions in a game. So far, the only game that I've really played that has actually taken advantage of this is Spider-Man Miles Morales. They used it for swinging around the city, making the webs feel differently when you squeeze the trigger. Other than that, Astro's Playroom did make really good use of them, but that's more of a demo for what the controller can do than an actual game. I have also heard that they do feel different for certain games such as Call of Duty, Cold War, where the triggers do change feel depending on which gun you're using, and also for future implementations such as the upcoming Horizon game, which they will program for things such as bows and different kinds of weapons. The haptics are also improved, giving much more precise feeling to certain environments, but again this is going to be more of a developer option than a standard feature. Usually they're gonna probably work more like standard rumble on all the other controllers, unless taken advantage of, which is probably gonna be mostly Sony's first party studios. The controller still does have the built-in speaker, same as the DualShock 4 did before. However, this time you do get a mic, which can be enabled or disabled with this button here. The touch bar also is making a comeback probably mostly because of backwards compatibility with the PlayStation 4. Other than that, I don't think we're going to be seeing any new uses for it. Same as the last generation. Sony has also went with USB Type-C this time around, making them the last big company to really make the switch, thankfully. The D-pad is fine. It has enough of a click. Honestly, it feels a little bit of a downgrade compared to the DualShock 4, but it's okay. It's not great, it's not terrible. The rest of the buttons feel good. Other than the fact that they're no longer color coded, which I'm so used to seeing on a Sony controller. Like that. The analog sticks are okay as well. I think they're about as good as they're ever gonna get. And the triggers, like I said, do feel a lot better this time than last time. The bumpers feel great. Here's a quick little size comparison. Doesn't look that much bigger, but it definitely feels much bigger and better in the hand. It's also quite a bit heavier. Alright guys, now last but not least is the Google Stadia controller. This controller is typically around 69 US dollars. It does go on sale from time to time. For Black Friday it was $51. This however is the full Stadia kit, not just the controller itself. It's a little bit more expensive, it's around $99. However, you do need it in order to actually play Stadia. It comes with the Chromecast Ultra. If you already have a Chromecast Ultra or you want to use this as a standalone PC controller, you do not need to buy the full kit. Inside the box, regardless of which one you get, you do get the controller itself. And also, regardless of which one you get, you do get the charge cable. What you would not get with the regular controller is the Chromecast Ultra and the power supply for it. The Stadia controller 
and the Nintendo Switch Pro Controller are both on this list for a completely separate reason than the other two were. And that's because they can be paired with a PC for standalone PC controllers. The Stadia controller is pretty comfortable in the hand. The D-pad is actually not that bad. It's usable. All of the buttons feel okay. The analog sticks are alright. The only thing that I really do not like about it too much is the triggers. They're really soft and have no resistance howsoever all the way down. They feel the same no matter how far you pull them down. It also does come with a 3.5mm jack and it has a built in mic. Another benefit of the Stadia controller is if you do like your analog sticks similar to their PlayStation where they're next to each other instead of being offset like how they are on the Switch Pro or the Xbox controller. It does also have a rechargeable battery built in. It charges via USB Type-C just like all the rest of them. Other than that it's a pretty solid feeling controller. And last but not least we do have the Nintendo Switch Pro controller. It also has a rechargeable battery and USB Type-C charging. In the hand it feels pretty much identical to an Xbox controller. If you've ever held one of those you are not too far off from what this feels like. The buttons are pretty good. The D-pad is really really good. It's probably the best one of the bunch that I've tried so far. The only thing I really don't like about it and this seems to be a trend with anything besides Sony and Microsoft is the triggers. There is no travel howsoever. It's either on or off. It's like the shoulder buttons. I'm not a big fan of this, especially for shooting games. I like to have a little bit more control over the triggers. Okay, so my final thoughts. I think the most innovative and fresh feeling of the bunch is the new DualSense controller. It is something that actually adds to the experience and you will not be disappointed with. And if you prefer your analog sticks next to each other like I do, it is going to be a great PC option for some as well. Steam has already added support for the DualSense and as time goes on, drivers and support will continue to improve as well. That being said, the Xbox controller will probably be your best bet for a PC controller. It's built by Microsoft so you will always have driver support. On top of that, the button layout will always be pre-mapped. You will not have to do any kind of remapping in the software to use this as a PC controller. And for the price being the cheapest out of the entire bunch, it is by far the most recommended. As for the Switch Pro controller, it's not a bad choice. If you already have a Nintendo Switch and would like to use this in docked mode instead of the Joy-Cons, it is a lot more comfortable. And if you already own the controller, it is not a bad choice for a PC controller. It's just not my first pick. And last but not least is the Stadia controller. And this one is going to have to be a hard pass for me. Especially given its price point. It is not exactly the best option. The Microsoft controller does go on sale a lot more often. And it is cheaper. It is also compatible with Stadia itself. So regardless of if you're trying to use it as a PC controller or as game streaming controller for Stadia, the Xbox controller is a superior option. All right, guys, as mentioned before, we want to provide you with valuable content. We will be putting out tech related videos. I let Milan take over today because he has a lot more knowledge on the topic. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the subscribe button so you're notified when we put more of these out. Other than that, thank you for watching. Please like, share, comment, and subscribe, and I'll catch you next time. By the way, guys, this one's the best looking one, the dual sense.